MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram monkeypox update. Today we're going to talk about the origins of the monkeypox outbreak. And specifically, we're going to delve into the molecular biology of the virus and also the body's innate immune system and its mechanism of fighting monkeypox. Now, this paper that I have here titled Initial Observations About Putative ApoBec3 Deaminase Editing Driving Short-Term Evolution of MPXV, or monkeypox virus, since 2017, is a very technical paper, but it is very, very powerful in terms of allaying concerns about where this virus came from and what it's been doing for the last five years. It's very definitive, and I think it deserves a look. It's written by Anna O'Toole and Andrew Rambot from the Institute of Evolutionary Biology, University of Edinburgh in the UK. And as you can see, when we go to their webpage, Andrew Rambot is a member of the Institute of Evolutionary Biology in the School of Biological Sciences, interested in the evolution of emerging human viral pathogens, including Ebola, Zika, and influenza viruses. So he is well within his lane when he's talking about what's going on here with monkeypox. The first thing that we need to do, however, before we get involved in this article is to bring everybody up to speed and exactly how this virus replicates in the human body and what is this ApoBec3 that the body uses to actually attack viruses that are infecting it. So here is the cell and here is the nucleus of the cell. And this out here is known as the cytoplasm. And here we have our viral particle. And inside the viral particle is a double-stranded DNA. As opposed to coronavirus, which is RNA, monkeypox is a double-stranded DNA virus. And it infects the cell, and of course, the viral genome is released inside. The DNA is actually replicated in the cytoplasm of the cell and not the nucleus. Let's talk a little bit more in detail about that replication process. So for those of you who do not know, the double-stranded DNA is actually written in a particular order, and it goes from something we call the five prime end to the three prime end. And when it binds to itself in a double-stranded format, it's actually going in the opposite direction on the other side, five prime to three prime. So it's red in this direction from this side and red from this direction in that side. There are four base pairs that we know about in DNA. The first one is A or adenine. Second one is T, which is thymine. Next one is G, which is guanine. And then finally, the last one is C, which is cytosine. One of the things that you should know about is that in RNA, the T is actually replaced with a U, which is uracil. We'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about the innate immune system. And so the thing that you have to realize is that the A is always paired with the T and vice versa, and the G is always paired with the C and vice versa. So for instance, if we were to have a situation like where we had a T and a C here, then what would be bound on this side is that you would have an A here, because A binds with T, and you would have a G here as well, because that binds with the C. And of course, there are other base pairs that goes on and on for quite a long time. In the cytoplasm, when you have DNA replication, these two strands come apart and the base pairing rules continue. So let's tear those apart here and let's say we've got five prime and a number of base pairs and we come to T and C and we go to three prime. And then this of course comes down here and we have three prime goes to A and G and then five prime. Now what's gonna happen when it's creating two new strands for replication? is that these nucleotides are gonna be bound in there, and so you're going to get, let's use a different color here so you can see this, A is gonna come on here, and G is gonna come on here, and down here, T is gonna come on here, and of course, C is gonna come on here. And so what you've done here is you've made two new strands, one and two. And so with this process, the virus is going to hijack the machinery of the cell and make more copies of itself. Unless, of course, the body has something to say about that. So let's back up and show you what the innate immune system can do in this situation. 
So here we are back at the point where the virus is going to replicate in the cytoplasm of the cell that it's infected. And it's split apart its double-stranded DNA into two separate strands, and it's looking to replicate itself. Here's what happens now. Enter in the innate immune system and an enzyme called ApoBEC3. Or if you want the long name for it, it's apolipoprotein B mRNA editing enzyme catalytic subunit. And it does something that's very nasty to the genome of the virus. What it does is it takes any Cs and converts them into Us. In other words, it takes cytosines and converts them into uracils by deaminasing it. And so if you look here, here is a cytosine. And for some reason, this enzyme likes to work better when it's preceded on the 5' prime side with a T. So it doesn't do this to all Cs. It does it to only Cs that are preceded by Ts. And we'll talk a little bit more about other aspects of it. So if it's going to convert this C into a U while it's become single-stranded, remember what the base pairing rules are going to be. So what's going to happen now is base pairing rules come in. You're going to have a 3' prime. And it's going to still be, against the T, it's going to be an A. And instead of a C, it's going to be a U. This is also going to be A. And then you're going to have the 5 prime N. Now down here, nothing's going to change. It's still going to be T and C and the 3 prime end. And then what you can imagine is that this strand right here is then going to undergo replication. And again, what we're going to have here is a T U at the top and an AA here, and then what's gonna happen? Again, the T is gonna combine with an A, and the U is gonna combine with another A, and then this A and A is gonna be a T and a T. And so what you can see happening here, if you notice very carefully, is that you're taking a TC, and it's going to turn into a TT. But the other thing that you're gonna see here is this. You're gonna have an issue where you have AG, and it's gonna turn into an AA. The innate immune system's ApoBec3 has the tendency to take TCs and convert them into TTs. And similarly, because we always read five prime to three prime, it has the ability to take GAs, GA, and convert those into AAs. So you might be wondering, well, what happens to this down here? Does it get mutated? Well, remember that further on this way is going to be another base pair that's also going to be similar in terms of a TC. And so this strand is not going to be free of mutations. It's also going to get mutated as well. And so the point of this is, is that when this enzyme is doing what it needs to do, this ApoBEC3, it's mutating the virus so badly that hopefully it becomes unviable and it doesn't get transmitted and it goes nowhere. And so if that's the case, you will never see the effect of heavy mutation rates from ApoBEC3. The only thing that you would see are mutations that are not severe enough to cause the virus to completely shut down. You will only see mutations in areas where it does not cause a big problem because those are the only types of viruses that you're going to see downstream or the ones that actually survive this mutation. So this is sort of like battle scars. Imagine going out to a war and the viral army is meeting the innate host immune system's army. You never see the ones that come back that were killed so badly by the innate immune system because they died on the field. The only ones that you see that come back are the ones that had wounds that were not fatal. And so when we look at the genome of monkeypox and we see these types of mutations, then we know that this has been the result of a host's innate immune system, ApoBEC3, that's inflicted mutational injury on monkeypox. So make sure you understand that because we're going to go back and we're going to show you the lineage of the current monkeypox outbreak here in 2022. And as you can see here in the document, it says this document is an initial report on the observation of an abundance of specific mutations in the 2022 monkeypox virus outbreak and related virus genomes that can be ascribed to the action of ApoBEC3 host enzymes. So the first question that concerns us is where did this virus come from? 
And as they say here in the article, the first monkeypox virus genome sequences from the monkeypox cases this year in 2022 show phylogenetically that these viruses have descended from a clade sampled in 2017 to 2019 from cases diagnosed in Singapore, Israel, Nigeria, and the UK. Now let's deep dive a little bit more on that because there was another paper that was published on the platform Research Square preprint. And after they sequenced it, they showed that the 2022 outbreak cluster forms a divergent branch descendant from a branch with viruses associated with the exportation of monkeypox virus in 2018 and 2019 from an endemic country, Nigeria, to the United Kingdom, Israel, and Singapore. And this goes back to our last video, which we talked about, which showed that this virus has been brewing in Nigeria since 2017. And all of these have a genetic linkage to a large outbreak occurring in Nigeria in 2017 to 2018. They go on further to state that given these findings and the worldwide epidemiology of monkeypox, it is likely that the emergence of the 2022 outbreak resulted from recent importations of this monkeypox variant from an endemic country. And the most likely candidate there again is Nigeria. So going back to our paper that we're talking about, they looked at the gene sequencing of monkeypox going all the way back to 1971 and a number of samples since that time. And this is what they found. You can see here this phylogenetic tree going all the way back here to 1971. And then what's happened in 2017, 2018 to 2019, and then even now in 2022. And we can see what has happened in terms of the genetic mutations. The first thing that I want you to notice here is that if we look at 2017, which is when things started to heat up in terms of monkeypox in Nigeria, you can see that each one of these dots here represents when there was a mutation that was seen in the genome of monkeypox. And what are these related to? Well, the blue dots are these TCs to TTs. It's kind of small to see here, but the blue dots represent these TCs to TT mutations. Again, this is exactly the mutation that happens when you have the innate immune system working on the virus. The other one that we talked about was the GA to the AA mutation, which is exactly what we're seeing here. In fact, the majority of all of these dots that you can see here are either blue dots, which are the TC to TT mutation, or the yellow dots, which are the GA to AA mutation. And so what does this mean? What this means is that ever since back in 2017 approximately, the entire mutational library that they see in this monkeypox virus that is now consisting of this 2022 outbreak, almost all of these mutations are related to the type of mutation that we see with the ApoBEC3 deamination mutation by the host. So the question is, is this the result? In other words, has this virus, this monkeypox virus, been hanging around in hosts, going from host to host to host for the last five years, either in the human population or in some primate or mammalian population that is non-human? And that's the reason why it is mutated up to this point. And again, we can trace this all the way back to 1971 which makes the current outbreak of monkeypox much more likely to be a result of mutation in humans in Nigeria than it does from someplace else. So the next question that these authors raised was, is this putative ApoBEC3 editing occurring in non-human animal reservoirs, or is it happening in humans as the result of sustained human transmission? Is the action of ApoBEC3 acting as a driver of adaption to humans as a host? So this is how they tried to answer it. They figured that if, in fact, this ApoBEC3 deamination activity was due to humans, then we shouldn't see much of that type of activity prior to 2017, because the first really big spike in human cases in Nigeria was after 2017. And so if they were to look at variants of monkeypox prior to 2017, they shouldn't be seeing a lot of ApoBEC activity prior to that if this was related to human ApoBEC activity. However, if it was related to non-human, then we should see the same amount of mutations occurring prior to 2017. They say here that if ApoBEC deamination is characteristic of replication in humans, 
then we would expect to see very little evidence of it prior to the 2017 outbreak, as this would primarily represent replication in the non-human reservoir. To examine this, we selected further outgroup from Liberia, 1970, and they give the accession number, and identified 28 mutations that occur on the branch leading to the common ancestor of the 2017 monkeypox genome. So what did they find? Well, they found that there were, out of those 28 mutations, only 10 that seemed to fit the ApoBEC profile, which means that there may have been some human-to-human transfer prior to 2017, but not a lot. And because of this, they suggest that the pattern that they see in monkeypox genomes since 2017 is indicative of replication in humans and the inheritance of the specific changes that occur between 2017 and 2018, and then in the viruses from 2022, means that there has been sustained human-to-human transmission since at least 2017. And this would suggest that the reason why we are seeing the current outbreak of monkeypox is not because of some recent event, but a spillover of something that's been going on in Nigeria now for years with sustained human-to-human transmission. Okay, so what about the next question? Are these mutations that ApoBEC3 is doing to the viral monkeypox genome, is it conferring gain of function? They looked at the statistics because they know exactly how many times those nucleotides come up in the genome. They say here that the repertoire of mutations that ApoBEC3 is able to provide as genetic variation on which natural selection can act is severely restricted. Only a number of dinucleotide contacts are present. And the amino acid changes that ApoBEC3 editing can induce is also limited. As you can see here, there's only 13 different amino acid replacements that are possible, and they are not reversible by the same mechanism. This means that the chance that a mutation that confers a benefit to the virus is amongst the ones available through ApoBEC3 editing is very, very small. In other words, what they're saying here is that it's extremely unlikely that ApoBEC3 in any way could confer upon the virus any kind of gain of function. You can see that this paper is well referenced with a number of monkeypox viral genome sequences used in this study. And I would say overall that this paper is a very good read for those especially that are facile with molecular biology. It's well referenced and there's a number of comments from other colleagues and experts in the field. And of course we'll put a link in the description below to this article. I think there are a number of salient points from this. Number one, that even though we have learned about monkeypox now because it's in industrialized nations, this outbreak actually started before SARS-CoV-2. And the current genome in the 2022 current outbreak, based on the former outbreak in 2017, tells the story about what's been going on, where it's been, and where it came from. As always, if you would like to have more information, this is a medical education channel, and I'd like to invite you to join us at medcram.com for a number of continuing medical education seminars, including those on ECG interpretation, Chem7 results, CBC results, vasopressors, and many, many others. Over 60 hours of continuing medical education available at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.